you know, so pretty simple, self-explanatory passage, a lot of, you know, pre-Thanksgiving feel-good stuff in there, and, you know, not a whole lot of explanation required. Um, Clearly, that's not true. Um, Let's start with the obvious, that this is an incredibly messy passage of scripture, right? It would, you're not getting something wrong if, as Dan was reading that, if, as you were following along, you were like, wait, what in the world is going on here? Um, it is really confusing to try to figure out what Paul is doing here. Um, and in fact, let's just acknowledge the obvious. If you were to come at this passage without uh, a solid understanding of how Paul sometimes approaches theological arguments, and if you were come to this passage without a pretty decent working knowledge of the book of Genesis, you can land in some places that will and should make you decidedly uncomfortable, right? I mean, let's just start with the fact that it really looks like Paul is slamming this woman named Hagar and her son, his name is Ishmael, um, because Hagar was a slave and she was carrying Abraham's child, which all of a sudden starts to raise a number of questions and set off a number of alarm bells in our mind, right? Um, There are There are um, overtones of racism in the passage that we're going to confront this morning, right? The book of Genesis will record, uh, obviously, not just that Abraham and Sarah are Jewish, but that Hagar is Egyptian. And there's questions that are lingering right under the surface. But the real issue that we have to deal with is it really seems like Paul is making Hagar out to be the bad guy in this story. And I would understand why you would arrive at that conclusion if you just read Galatians 4 on its own. Um, I also want to assure you that that's not the case. Actually, stick with me because I think most of us have some misconceptions when it comes to the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. And we're going to spend a lot of our time kind of unpacking the background that Paul brought with him to this passage of scripture. But the other thing you need to know, in addition to the background, which we will spend a lot of time on, is that there is a um, rhetorical device. There's something Paul does, right? You can never forget that Paul was one of the preeminent theologians of his day. This was a guy who was deeply steeped in the language and the practice of theological argumentation. This was kind of what Paul did even before he became sort of the leading missionary of the New Testament church and wrote um, the majority of, you know, the epistles in the New Testament. So Paul is employing a device that we're not all that familiar with, but his readers would have been. It's what scholars will call theological concession, right? And and what it means is that Paul is, for the sake of argument, willing to go along with someone's misunderstanding of Scripture, even when he knows they're wrong, because he intends to use their own argument against them. And that's what he's doing Right here. He's not necessarily endorsing everything that the Jewish people had taken away from the story of Abraham and Sarah, but he's saying, hey, I'm going to work with your understanding. And I'm going to even end up using your understanding against you uh, um, in an attempt to show you that what you're doing, what you're arguing, just doesn't carry any um, theological validity to it, right? A couple years ago, I had the chance to work with um, a leadership consultant, management consultant kind of guy, and he was following me around, going to a bunch of meetings. And after a meeting, he pulled me aside one day, and he's like, hey, man, you don't know much about judo, do you? I was like, no, I I don't. I mean, martial art, I got that. I don't even know which one. And he's like, man, here's the basic principle of judo. Um, By the way, if you know judo, I'm assuming this is right. This is judo according to a leadership consultant. But he was like, hey, here's the basic principle of judo. In judo, you use your opponent's momentum against him. He's like, so what you're doing, I've watched you in these meetings. Every time somebody's going in a direction that you don't agree with, you kind of feel like you're obligated to stop and push back as hard as, as you can. And I was like, well, yeah. And he's like, and that's not always wrong. That's not invalid. That's not bad. But sometimes judo says, hey, instead of just arguing against, what if you took that person's argument and almost helped them get to the conclusion and realize that what they're arguing doesn't work? Kind of use their argument 
um, against them, kind of help play it out to its logical conclusion and be like, see, that's why we can't do your idea. And I was like, oh, man, that was great. That was really helpful for me. So there you go, a little free professional development for you this morning. But that is not just a random story to show that there was a time that I had a real job before I became a pastor. That is a story to help understand what Paul is doing here. He's kind of playing judo. He's like, hey, I'm going to use your argument against you ultimately, okay? I'm doing all of this just because it is a really tricky passage. Now, the other thing we have to do before we dive into the kind of nuts and bolts of this passage is to understand that Paul's overall objective here is to remind his readers, whether they were Jewish or Gentile, that they are, in fact, children of promise, right? That's Galatians chapter 4, verse 28. Now, you, brothers, you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, Isaac was the son that was born to Abraham and his wife, Sarah. You, like Isaac, are children of promise. He is reminding his Jewish readers that they are the descendants of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And he is telling his Gentile readers that through their faith in Jesus Christ, they have also become children of promise. So if you're here this morning, you know, whether you're background is Jewish, Gentile, or whatever, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are also a child of promise. We're going to have to talk about what that means, but he's saying, hey, let's just be really clear. That's who you are, right? And that part, he's not trying to challenge, right? That's not the part that he's going to try, you know, to use this language of, you know, theological concession against. That's the part that he's going to try to affirm. In fact, what he's going to do, though, is not just affirm their identity. He's going to attempt to paint a clearer picture of what it actually means to be a child of promise. Because what he's trying to say is, look, you know who you are, but you're not living according to that. In fact, what he's really saying, and this will make sense if you've been here over the last couple of weeks because you've heard him use similar language. He's like, hey, you make such a big deal out of the fact that you're the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You make such a big deal that you're the descendants of the free woman. Why is it that you are now so willing to submit yourself to various forms of spiritual bondage? Right, whether that means observing certain rituals and festivals, whether that means Mosaic law, whether that means Jewish dietary law, whether that means circumcision, whether that means the belief that you have to obey the commands of God in order to earn salvation, whatever it means, all kinds of different forms that he's dealt with in Galatians. He's like, hello, you're the children of promise. Remember, there's a freedom in your life. Why are you trading in that freedom for some form of spiritual bondage? He wants to pull them back out of that, and he wants to call them to a new and a different way of living their lives. He wants to call you and me to a new and different way of living our lives as children of promise. Right? So if you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus, the question should be how much does your life look like you are a child of promise. Are you truly living out of that identity? Or are there some ways that you have traded your identity in Christ for various forms of spiritual bondage? Now, if you're joining us again, whether in person or online, and you are not yet a follower of Christ, this is the work that God wants to do in your life, right? God is not sending you out on a mission, you know, to clean up your life, get your act together, and then come back to him when you've made yourself acceptable. He's saying, no, no, no. Jesus goes to the cross. He dies in our place to forgive us of our sin so that we, like Isaac, can become children of promise, right? The question is, what's that look like? And we're going to spend our time working through that. The first thing that it means to be a child of promise is that you and I would be living our life with a sense of humble, confidence, right? The humility comes from passages like Galatians 4, 23. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. All that means is kind of born the natural way that every human being is born, while the son of the free woman was born through promise, right? That's where Paul starts to develop this language, that there was some sort of a promise of God spoken over this child's life before he was ever born, right? That 
Abraham and Hagar, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but they conceived a child through natural means. There was no promise of God. There was no divine activity. There was nothing theologically significant. It was just a biological thing that happened. Right? Abraham and Sarah, their child Isaac, is the result of God's promise. Look at Genesis 17 with me, and we'll start to see the promise. Right? This is when we're going to start to fill in the backstory a little bit. God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. There's the promise right there. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Because right, remember, back in Genesis 12, God has entered into a covenant with Abraham where he has declared a number of things. But one of the primary things that God promised Abraham was descendants. He promised him that he would be the father of a multitude of people, of a great nation. And here's Abraham at 100 with his wife at 90 being like, man, the descendants haven't happened. And the window for that seems to have closed and we're not sure what's going on, yet God shows up and reiterates this promise and says, yes, Sarah's going to have a child, right? Isaac does absolutely nothing to earn the distinction of being a child of promise, right? If you were to go back and read through all of Genesis and you're like, man, so what does Isaac do to earn this status? The answer is absolutely nothing. Nothing, because again, in Genesis 17, just a few verses later, Genesis 17, 19, God says, no, but Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. So the point that I'm trying to make with all of this, the point that's gonna be really helpful for us is that all of God's promises to Isaac were made before Isaac was even born, right? So by definition, there's nothing that Isaac could do to earn this status. It was the grace of God over his life. It was the choice of God over his life. It was the mercy of God over the life of Isaiah of, of Isaac, right? By the way, some of you see where I'm going. Same thing applies to us as followers of Jesus Christ, right? If we're thinking, oh man, I did something that earned my salvation. Oh man, I have done a couple things in life that have made me particularly attractive to God. We need to recenter our hearts on the gospel because look at what Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says about us, right? For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Right? So if our understanding of Christianity makes us feel in any way superior to anybody else, man, we just need to reset our hearts and our minds as quickly as possible to the truth of the gospel. See, the biggest mistake that the Jewish people had made is they had looked at the fact that God had chosen Abraham and God had chosen Isaac and God had chosen Jacob and God had worked through that lineage and they had begun to assume that that made them better than everybody else. Right, that they were somehow superior. And, and what Paul is doing here and what we see throughout Scripture is, look, you didn't do anything to earn this. Just like we haven't done anything to earn the grace of God in our lives. So pride should never well up in our hearts as followers of Jesus. There should be a tremendous humility inside of us that says, wow. I've been saved by the grace of God. It's not my own doing. It was a gift from God. It's not the result of my works, right? I have nothing to boast in. I have no reason to feel superior. I have no reason to look down on other people. Also, incidentally, you have no reason to feel inferior or less than other people, right? There's a humility, but that humility, when we understand it, also breeds a deep confidence in us, right? It's a confidence that comes from understanding that God's love for us is not based 
on our performance. And that is essential to remember, not just in terms of salvation, not just in terms of what does it mean to become a Christian, but we need to remember that every single day in our battle against sin. Right? Because every single one of us in this room, online, there is not one of us who will make it through today unscathed by sin. Right, there's going to be something that comes out of our mouth. There's going to be something we do. There's going to be something that runs through our head. Some attitude. We're going to be confronted with the reality of our sin today. Right? We will be confronted with the reality of our sin this week. And the question is, when that happens, do you believe that your sin impacts God's love for you? Now, to be clear, when we sin, it does quench and grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It may put distance in our relationship between God. God may even discipline us as any good father does a child that they love. But God absolutely never, ever stops loving us with a pure, holy, fierce, personal love. Right? Karen Swallow Pryor is a um, professor down at Southeastern Seminary in North Carolina. One of the ways that she explains the significance of this passage and this idea is by saying, hey, you know, if you are operating with a uh, performance based uh, relationship with God, when you sin, you will feel like, I messed up. Dad's going to kill me. But if you understand the gospel, you will operate with a, I messed up. I've got to call dad kind of mentality. Right? It's the difference of whether you think God is somebody that you need to run from or God is somebody that you need to run to in the moments where you're confronted with your own sin. Right? And in our family, one of the most important discipleship questions that we ask, you know, that I ask frequently of my three kids is, hey, tell me why does dad love you? Right. I would ask it all kinds of different times, but frequently, if there's been a moment of discipline, a moment of correction in our family, and we'll kind of deal with what happened, I'll be like, hey, but let me ask you, why, why does dad love you? Right? And the older two, are, the boys, they kind of have it. They're always like, because we're your kids. And I'm like, yes, daddy never stops loving you because you're my kids. Right? We're working on it with Emma, our four-year-old. Right? Um, we had an opportunity to work through it this week. Um, well, things weren't, weren't quite right in her world, so we kind of fixed that. And I'm like, hey, Emma, why does daddy love you? And with all the sweetness and sincerity of a little four-year-old girl, she says, because. Right? Someday she's going to learn, learn to pronounce because, and it's going to be the saddest thing that's ever happened. But right now it's because. She looks at me with her big brown eyes. She goes, because I'm cute. I'm like, okay, you are, and that doesn't hurt your cause around here. But no, daddy doesn't love you because you're cute. Daddy doesn't love you because you're sweet or smart or follow the rules or eat your dinner because Lord knows that's not on the table right now. Uh, but daddy, no, daddy loves you because you're my daughter. I love you because you're my kid, right? That's what God is saying to us through the gospel. So humble but confident. It's a beautiful pairing when we can get that right. Now, of course, the question is, okay, well, that's great. You know, God has somehow declared me a child of promise. I didn't do anything. It's grace. It's mercy. But what about the rest of the world? Like, yay, here we are singing our Jesus songs, having our Bible study, and we'll do it with humble confidence. But isn't this, like, what about everybody else? What about everybody else that doesn't seem to be in on the promise yet? What are we supposed to do with that, and this is where we really need to stop and kind of recalibrate ourselves around um, the Genesis account of Abraham and of Sarah and of Hagar, right? Because you know a little bit of it, right? You know Abraham has his promise, descendants, he's 100, Sarah's 90, no kid has happened, God says there's going to be a promise. But before God had the chance to fulfill the promise, Sarah had a plan. Sarah's plan was, hey, I'm going to offer my husband, Hagar, who was a servant, who was a slave, and say, hey, why don't you and Hagar see if you can go off and have a child? Hagar is sort of an innocent victim in that plan, right? She's not some sort of evil seductress that goes after the boss at all. She is an innocent 
victim of what we would probably today describe as human trafficking, sexual assault, a number of different things. But lo and behold, they conceive a child. And when that happens, Hagar um, starts to um, realize that she's going to have some influence around the house because she has done for Abraham what Sarah was never able to do. Sarah doesn't like that very much at all. So the Bible says she treated Hagar harshly, which is probably a euphemism for she beat her and she drove her away. Right, so at this point, you're looking at Hagar, and you're like, man, my heart is breaking for Hagar. And Sarah, you're not looking so good right now. Hagar's out in the wilderness, and the angel of God appears to her and says, hey, you are going to have a son. His name's going to be Ishmael, and I need you to go back. God has a plan for this boy's life as well. So she goes back, um, delivers her son, delivers Ishmael. Um, Ishmael lives as the only child of Abraham for 13 years. And during those 13 years, Abraham falls in love with this kid. He's... His boy. In fact, in Genesis 17, you might have noticed I skipped a verse where God is kind of offering this promise of a descendant through Sarah. The verse that I skipped is the verse where Abraham actually says, Hey, what if we just establish my line through Ishmael? Abraham goes to bat for Ishmael. He's like, I love this kid. He's great. Why don't we just do it through Ishmael? And God's like, no, I'm going to establish my covenant through Isaac. So Sarah ultimately delivers Isaac. He is circumcised on the eighth day. And then something happens at the circumcision where um, Ishmael, the scripture will say he laughed um, at his brother, which you, know, you kind of read that and you're like, okay, this is sort of like a 13-year-old boy at a circumcision and he's just kind of finding something to giggle about and what's going on. But I think what really is going on in that moment is there's an animosity developing from Ishmael to Isaac because Ishmael understands that his status around the house is about to change dramatically. He's been the guy, but now there is a quote-unquote legitimate heir and this is going to change life for Ishmael and he's not too happy about it. Sarah sees Ishmael's response, and again, she drives Hagar and Ishmael away, this time for good. So if you were to go through this whole story and be like, man, who do you most identify with? Who do you most like? Who does your heart break for? Who do you gravitate toward? You'd be like, wait, Hagar, she's the one that seems the most virtuous in the entire Genesis account. It's certainly not Sarah. She does not come out looking well. And it's really not Abraham because he goes along with the whole thing and isn't doing a great job leading his family to believe in the promises of God. It's Hagar that our hearts break for. It's Hagar that we say, hey, somebody's got to do something to help her. And if you understand that, you understand what our attitude to the rest of the world should be. Not an attitude of indifference, not an attitude of judgment, not an attitude of condemnation, not an attitude of shame, but an attitude of, hey, somebody needs to do something to serve the world. Somebody needs to do something to share the gospel with the world. Somebody needs to go after those people who've been driven far from the house of God. And guess who the somebody is meant to be? It's meant to be the church. We're meant to do what Abraham does. There's a touching moment in Genesis 21. Sarah has driven Hagar away. Hagar and Ishmael are getting ready to go into the wilderness, this time for good. And Genesis 21, 14 records, So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, to us, we read that and we're like, okay. I mean, he's still kind of complicit in the sending her away. And okay, he gave her bread and water. I mean, it feels like, like like the least he could do. But thousands of years ago, the fact that this nobleman, this head of a giant family, this man who was phenomenally wealthy, would himself get up in the morning to go offer provisions for somebody who worked for his wife was unthinkable. And people would have read that and been like, are you kidding me? Look at what he is doing. Look at the compassion. And even if that doesn't move you and you're like, well, he could have done a whole lot more. Okay, fine. But Genesis 21, you know who really took care of Hagar? You know who really took care of Ishmael? It was God himself, Genesis 21, 17. And God heard the voice of the boy, that's Ishmael, who was crying because he was hungry. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is up. 
Lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, and I will make him into a great nation. Right? There's so much there that we could go into. We're going to gloss over a lot of that for the sake of time. But I want you to notice that neither Abraham nor God just discards Hagar. Neither Abraham nor God just discards Ishmael. There's almost a sense of, no, the children of promise need to look for ways to lovingly serve the world. And I just want to plant that seed. Because I want to tell you, as a church, we are going to have a number of opportunities to live this out during the month of December. Right? There are some things on the horizon for us as a church in terms of being able to lovingly serve our city and lovingly serve our world that I can't wait to tell you about. I'm not going to do it till after Thanksgiving, but for today, I just want to paint a picture and remind us that if we understand our identity as children of God, we will be enthusiastic about finding ways to lovingly serve our world, right? So there's got to be a humble confidence in us. And there's got to be a desire to lovingly serve the world in us. And finally, there should be a tenacity in us, right? There, there should be a resiliency in us. There should be some grit in us when life gets difficult, right? Because there's one passage here in Galatians that you're like, wait, what's going on here? Look at what he does in verse 29, Galatians 4, 29. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, that's Isaac, so also it is now. And the question is, hey, is that a reference to what happened at the circumcision? Probably. Is that a reference to some ongoing um, strain between the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac? Yes, we know that there's going to be conflict, particularly later down the line. But what Paul is reminding the Galatians and what he's reminding us is, yes, you are a child of promise. But even as a child of promise, we are not promised an easy life, right? None of us would look at Isaac's life, this child of covenant promise and say, oh man, he just had it so easy all of the time. All right? Remember there's the whole incident where Abraham has to take him to Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice and there's just in divine intervention at just the last moment. Right? That's kind of the famous example, but a Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, um, who was kind of the woman of his dreams, but chosen for him through an arranged marriage, they struggled with infertility for years. Ultimately, they were able to conceive two children, but they ended up as a family facing a famine that was so bad that um, they had to relocate, right? Um, in our world today, we would say they became refugees because of food insecurity is how, is how we would describe that. And that was their story as a family. When they food in the region and they had to move, right? Um, and then at the very end of his life, there's this story where he intends to bless Esau, his firstborn, but is tricked into blessing Jacob, the secondborn son. And his wife, Rebekah, is complicit in the whole thing. And scripture records that Isaac is so broken over what happens that he shakes violently in his bed as an old man. Right? That this man seemingly dies feeling betrayed by those who are closest to him. And, and the reason I'm, I'm saying all of this is we have a tendency to believe. We want to believe. There's a lot of churches that want to sell us on the reality that if you just make the decision to follow Jesus, that decision comes with a money-back guarantee of an easy life. Right? It comes with a money-back guarantee of unlimited blessing and unlimited favor and unlimited grace, and there's never going to be any stress, and nothing bad's ever going to happen, and we end up having absolutely no idea what to do with it when difficulty comes into our life. See, Paul in this passage is preaching against legalism, right? That's a, that's a message that we are by and large comfortable with as a church. By and large, as a church, we get that we are not saved by our works. We get that we are saved by the grace of God. But one of the forms of legalism that I think we struggle with deeply to this day is the idea that, yes, salvation is God's grace, but blessing is a result of my works. In other words, the better I do as a follower of Jesus, the more God is obligated to give me a good life and to give me a good life as I define it. The more I keep God's rules, the more he needs to give me what I am asking for. And we would never say it that nakedly, we would never say it that boldly, but that's not too far under the surface of our hearts, where we believe that to be a child of promise means to be promised an easy life. And Paul is saying, no, 
In fact, a life of loving service to the world will require difficulty. It will require sacrifice. You're going to be misunderstood. There's going to be people that take shots at you verbally because you're a follower of Jesus Christ. There's going to be moments where you're doing something that's difficult that you wouldn't do if you didn't believe that the grave was empty. Right? If everything in your life always makes sense and everything in your life always lines up with the expectations of people who don't yet know God, then maybe we're not reaching for the full vision of what God's called us to. Right? Well, there's supposed to be a little tenacity in us. There's supposed to be a little bit of, I know it's going to get difficult, but I believe along with David, Psalm 63, verse 3, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, right? We are to live our life so humbly confident in our relationship with God that we look to lovingly serve the world even when it costs us something, right? We should be a resilient, tenacious people, right? That's what it means to be a child of promise, which is way better than the conception that Paul is arguing against in Galatians 4 of, oh, look, I just have the right spiritual lineage, so I'm good with God, and he's pleased with me, and I'm better than everybody else. Paul's like, are you kidding? No, that's not what it means to be a child of promise. Right? Being a child of promise is not designed to puff you up. It's designed to humble us. Being a child of promise is not designed to give us license to sin. It's designed to remind us of grace in the moments where we do sin. Right? Being a child of promise is not designed to lead to a life of indifference. It's designed to make us a radically generous and sacrificial people. Right? Being a child of promise is not designed to fuel an expectation of ease in our life. It's designed to give us strength in the storm. And, and, and look, if we can hold on to that, we will ultimately follow Christ into a way of living that is so much deeper so much more significant and so much more impactful than anything else that you could find out there. So I hope your soul is encouraged this morning to be reminded that you are indeed a child of promise. I, I, I hope that gives you something to hold on to as we head into this week of Thanksgiving. Like, wait, I'm in a relationship with God and his love for me is not impacted by any of the choices I make. I'm held firm in my father's hand and nothing can pluck me out of his hand. Man, I'm taking something from that. But I also help it helps shape the way that we interact with others. I hope that it helps shape the way that we interact with the world. And I hope it helps us in the moment where this week may not live up to our expectations for any one of a thousand different reasons. You're a child of promise. And that means something. That's not just theological rhetoric. That's God speaking over your life and saying, let me just tell you who you are. And let me tell you what it looks like to go live in light of that. So let's pray. Father, we can't do this without your grace. We don't get to humble confidence apart from the work of your spirit. We don't get to loving service without you doing something on our behalf. Father, would you give us the humility that we need to admit that we can't live this way without you? But would you also give us just a tremendous confidence that you want to give us what we need to live this way? that you long for us to shine like stars in the universe, that you long for us to be your ambassadors in this city, that you long for us to represent your grace and your mercy in our families. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us live differently. Help us be willing to serve. Help us to be willing to sacrifice. Make us strong, make us brave, make us bold, God. Use us for your purposes. I pray that over each one of us, God. Use us this week for your glory and use us this week for the good of others. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.